All right. Um, so welcome everybody once again to the Sewer Fundamental class. Um, this class is geared towards SewerCAD and Sewer Gems users. Um, so as I was saying, this class um, is useful for either SewerCAD or Sewer Gems users. Um, as you may have guessed, because it's fundamentals, uh, all the workshops uh, will be done using the SewerCAD solver. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, if you want to know more about the advanced features of sewer gems, um, like storm modeling and things like that, there is another class. Um, but this one only covers the SewerCAD um, solver. Um, so today we're going to learn a little bit about the basics of sewer systems. Uh, we learn about steady flow simulations in gravity sewers. Um, towards the end of today, we learn about the theory of pumping in sewer systems. Um, and then tomorrow we do some exercises on doing simulations uh, over time, what we call extended period simulations. Uh, we'll help you build a model. So we'll actually build a simple model in class, uh, but we'll cover all the theory and all the possibilities in our presentation. Um, and we'll also teach you how to use a tool, which we call automated design, uh, in the software that can help you do constraint-based sewer design. So you basically input um, your design criteria, such as minimum and maximum cover, minimum and maximum velocity, or tractive stress, if that's what's used um, in your location. Uh, things like minimum maximum diameters, things of that sort, and the software can do uh, sizing of your pipes. Uh, so it can tell you the diameters, the slopes, input elevations, and whatnot. So it's pretty, pretty neat. Okay, so what do wastewater collection system engineers do? Uh, typically, uh, they're tasked with sizing the pipes and figuring out the invert elevation so that it meets um, a requirement of either velocity of the flow or tractive stress. So figure out the slopes of our pipes. Um, also, we need to make sure that uh, when we put a pipe in place, there is a minimum cover um, associated with that. So that's typically the number one um, job if a collect wastewater collection system engineer. Uh, also, uh, if you have a large system, you have to identify where are the bottlenecks. If there are overflows, uh, nobody likes sanitary sewer overflows, <laughs> so uh, it would be your job to solve those problems. Uh, and as I mentioned, meet regulatory requirements. Okay, so how can a product like sewer cat or sewer gems um, help you in your day-to-day -day job. Um, you can use it to do subdivision design. Uh, so if you're, for example, an engineering um, consultant and you want to design a new subdivision, you want to size all the um, sewers, um, you can use a model like sewer cat or sewer gems for that. Uh, you can also use it for master planning, for designing interceptors, uh, if you have to design a pump station, uh, force main, um, selecting the right pump for your um, circumstances. Um, we can do both gravity and pressure calculations. So we can do, uh, we can help you with either one of those. Uh, nowadays, there's a lot of talk of low impact development. Um, so really things geared towards reducing the amount of rainwater that ends up in the collection system. So we can also help with some of that, especially in sewer gems. Um, if you have things like overflows, uh, we can help mitigate that. So basically simulate uh, where those are happening and figure out a strategy for overcoming those. Uh, if you're doing inflow and infiltration studies, uh, especially when you have older systems that have um, 
you know, old pipes that are cracked and just a lot of infiltration coming into your sanitary sewer system. Um, you can figure out the impact of that as well. Um, as you will see, uh, sewer CAD is typically meant for sanitary only uh, analysis. Uh, sewer gems is more for both uh, what we call combined systems, right? So uh, sewer and store. Um, we can do all these other things like pump operations. Um, if you have to extend your system to serve other users, you know, are you going to have uh, enough capacity for that uh, as it is? Or maybe you need to expand your gravity pipes um, and things like that. Okay, so when I refer to a sewer system, um, I basically am talking about... Uh, the system, the pipes, the manholes, etc., that conveys convey all the wastewater uh, to a treatment plant. And sometimes, as we mentioned, stormwater is also conveyed. And the primary components are gravity pipes, uh, manholes or access chambers, pump stations, and pressure mains. Uh, the idea with the sewer system is that we design it for gravity flow because it doesn't cost anything, right? Uh, if we have anytime we have to pump, it's an additional cost and maintenance and just one more thing to worry about. Okay, so where all this wastewater comes from is domestic, commercial, and industrial sources. Uh, but you might also have things like illegal connections uh, if it's an old system or maybe depending on the pipe uh, material or if it's um, a kind of soil that just moves too much and things move around a little bit, you can have infiltration. And sometimes uh, the storm system that is supposed to be separate gets accidentally connected to the sanitary sewer system. So you could have inflow from uh, those storm sources as well. So typically, we talk about a sanitary-only system, uh, storm-only system. Um, we want to keep these separate because uh, what happened in the past is there was only one system that would uh, convey, convey both sanitary and storm um, water. And the problem with that is that when it rains too much, then you know you're actually having to send uh, storm water to the treatment plant, uh, which is really not the most efficient thing to do. So we want to keep those separate and only treat uh, sanitary wastewater. But uh, as I mentioned, older systems tend to be uh, combined. Here is a picture of a separate sanitary sewer. Uh, so you can see here we have a storm sewer, typically larger in diameter. And then we have the sanitary sewer. Uh, but as you see, sometimes we have cracks, uh, misaligned joints, uh, faulty connections, maybe a catch basin that got connected by mistake, uh, deteriorated manholes or leaky manhole covers. So those are all the potential um, sources of water that can go into a sanitary sewer. Um, here we see a storm sewer that would have our... Um, catch basins or inlets basically connected to them. And you can have both infiltration and also exfiltration, right? So water um, leaking out of your pipes. Uh, but typically we want to keep them um, separate, especially if it's a new system. Here's a picture of what a combined sewer would look like. So here we have all our rainfall derived sources. So it rains and we see overland flow, gutter flow going to your inlets, um, going to a manhole that also has domestic wastewater, industrial water uh, coming into it. Uh, and typically when you have combined sewers, uh, if it isn't raining, then it's not a big deal. All that water can go to the wastewater treatment plant and then be treated and then discharge uh, back to you know, a river in this case, um, you know, under certain, um, meeting certain regulatory conditions, right? So that would be great. The problem that happens 
when it rains and especially when it rains a lot because you can't really handle all those flows at the wastewater treatment plant. And what ends up happening is you have a regulatory structure like this, a regulator structure, uh, where you say, okay, uh, when the flow gets to be too much, just dump it to the river as a combined sewer overflows. And we know that that's not desirable. And uh, in many places in the world, you actually get fined for that combined sewer overflow. Okay, so now we're pretty sure or pretty certain about the types of um, sources of water that can be conveyed through our system. And how do we actually convey that? Um, mainly gravity flow. Again, that's what we want to do because, you know, gravity is doing the work for us. It doesn't cost us uh, energy to pump. Um, sometimes you have the situation where the gravity flow is surcharged so it's actually pressurized in a gravity pipe that um, may or not have been may or may not have been the intention um, you could also have inverted siphons uh, especially if you have to pass under a river or a structure that you know would be a problem I'll show you a picture of those in a bit uh, you can also have a uh, pressure flow that it's intended to be pressure so you use a force main you can have pressure sewers um, also called grinder uh, pumps uh, basically means at each uh, house or location in that area whether it's industrial uh, you have in the basement a little tank that collects the wastewater from that building and then it pumps it um, using those um, pressure grinders and that just becomes just a little um, pipe coming out and it doesn't matter if it's a you know uh, well, we, we'll talk a little bit about uh, why those get put in place um, but all these things can be modeled in our products uh, and then the last thing it's vacuum sewers um, in vacuum sewers the flow is pulled through the system by vacuum pumps um, that's really the only case we don't handle uh, with our software, uh, but it's actually very rare um, to find that. Okay, um, so now we know what kind of flows can be handled. Uh, there's also the conservation of how our flows look like in time. Most of the time, if you're doing a sizing of your pipes, uh, it's okay and it's enough to do a simulation in what we call steady state um, because we are uh, designing a sewer to provide enough capacity to convey the peak flows uh, and we don't really need to know what happens uh, when there's very little flows. So because we're concerned with extreme conditions, we just input the peak flows that we might have uh, at each of our uh, water sources, and then we pick a pipe big enough to handle those. Um, so that's typically what we use steady state for. Um, well, not only the, the we're concerned with sizing the pipes uh, using the biggest flows, right? But sometimes in steady state, we also do another kind of design, which is looking at, your, at our minimum flows. Uh, and why would we be concerned with those? because you're probably thinking already of the answer. And it's to make sure that you have enough of a slope uh, to, be, to be able to clean those pipes, right? So in many places, we use tractive forest. Uh, we, do, we used a lot of that in South America, I think in Europe um, as well. Uh, in the US, it's most typical to use a minimum velocity. So you wanna make sure that you have enough of a slope typically, which would generate a high velocity, right? Um, so you say, okay, if my minimum flow is this, uh, what would be the tractive force or the velocity? Okay, so we are concerned with both the high flows and the low flows. Uh, but we also do other kind of simulation, which is um, the unsteady, uh, typically called extended period simulation. 
and when would we need to do those kind of analysis, um, especially if you're do using pumps in your system. Uh, why? Because the pumps go on and off during the day. And you need to know, okay, how long, how many times a day does my pump go off? And for how long does it stay on? Because it costs money, right, to run it. So you need to see if the if the wet well or the tank that you're going to be storing that wastewater um, is big enough or maybe too big uh, for the situation. So you do need to see how that system behaves uh, over time. And the way we do that is we do a what's called a convex routing. We're going to go through the, the summary of the equations and everything that goes on in a little bit. So you'll see um, what that means. But basically, we generate hydrographs and we route them through the system using that convex routing methodology. Um, so the GVF solver uh, that is found in Stuart CAD can use both the steady state and un steady st unsteady simulations. Um, and if you are using the sewer gems uh, product, you will have another um, way of calculating uh, simulations over time, which is called the dynamic wave. Um, the dynamic wave always does simulations over time. Uh, the equations are slightly different than the unsteady. Um, it handles flow reversals, um, splits a little bit better than the unsteady. Uh, and it's typically what we refer to as the dynamic wave or the swim engines. So that's kind of the difference between of them. Between those two, we'll go through the specific of the details um, a little bit further ahead. Okay, so what does um, sewer cat or sewer gems do? Uh, you give them some information and it determines um, or it runs the calculations to figure out flows, velocities, depth, hydraulic rate lines, etc. Uh, but what do you need to input? Well, first of all, you need to input a map of your system, basically where everything is located. Um, so your manholes in relation to one another, uh, you enter the physical properties like diameters, materials, um, invert elevations. Uh, very important, the loading. So how much flow you estimate is going to enter your system at each of those particular points. Uh, and if you're doing rainfall simulation, um, then you need to know how much it rains, right? Uh, so given all that information, then the software calculates um, everything else for you. And how it does it, we're going to see that in a little bit. All right, so I mentioned that with sewer gems, you have a variety of engines. Uh, these are the four engines that you can find. Uh, the implicit is what is a default engine. It uses that dynamic wave and is what we call the sewer gems dynamic wave. Uh, the explicit solver is the same as the EPA swim solver. So if you have to um, maybe submit your work to an agency that requires that you use the swim solver, then you can use that one. Now they're very similar, these two. The GVF convex is the sewer can. Again, that's the one that we're going to be focusing on in this class because it is the one found in sewer can. Uh, and here you also have the GVF rational. GVS is the gradually varied flow solver and uses uh, the rational methodology, uh, which is actually what we use in another, another one of our products called Stormcat. So you basically have um, like four different products into one when you get sewer gems. Uh, and they all meet different modeling needs. So we'll take a look at each of those and see what they're good for. Uh, so the implicit, again, it's the default uh, sewer gems solver, solves the full seam and an equations. Uh, we developed it at Bentley based on the US National Weather Service um, flood wave model. It simultaneously solves for flow and hydraulic grade. And a very important distinction is that it uses the same set of equations for everything, 
both your gravity and the pressure. Um, basically, uh, for the pressure portions of it, it assumes that there's like, it's called the Priestman slot. And, uh, and then that's how we make the transition between gravity and pressure. Um, it only solves dynamic flows. So if you need to do a quick steady state design, just looking at peak flow, uh, you can't really do it in here. Some people would say, oh, yeah, I'm just going to run it for 10 minutes and see what happens. Um, but it's really not truly uh, steady state. Uh, and this kind of solver you can use for storm, sanitary, or combined sewers. Uh, the EPA swim solver also solves the false St. Venan equations based on the EPA swim. Uh, again, it simultaneously solves for flow and hydraulic grade. It uses the same equations for gravity and pressure. Uh, and this one, differently from the implicit, um, can have a way to use a different routing um, solver. Uh, that uses the kinematic wave solution. Uh, basically, if you have any backwater effects, it would ignore them. Uh, and again, this can be used to storm, sanitary, or combined sewers. This is a solver that we're going to be focusing this class on, so I'll spend a little bit more time explaining this one. Um, the basic concept of the gradually varied flow solver is that um, it uses the, well, first of all, it separates your system into subsystems. And you actually see that in the results when you run your calculations. So if you have a system that has a gravity portion, then it has a pressure uh, component to it, and then gravity again and pressure, uh, it will separate those into those subnetworks. Uh, for the gravity part, it solves for flow and uses that convex routing mechanism we talked about. And then once it knows the flows, it solves for the hydraulic grade. And the hydraulic grade calculations are done using the gradually varied flow equations. Um, so that's what happens for the gravity portions. Now for the pressure subnetworks, it uses a pressure solver, basically the same that you can find in our pressure products like water cut water gems. Uh, you can use this to perform extended period or steady state simulation. If you're using, uh, if you're using it for design, for example, uh, you can set your steady state simulation to use what we call extreme flow factors. Uh, so think of, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank at this moment, uh, the different equations that you can use to increase your flows. So you say, okay, this is my base flow giving so many people in this area is going to be uh, so many gallons per minute. And you can say, okay, uh, my peaking factor, uh, and you can use either your own equations or any of the pre-built equations that we have in the software. Um, it comes very handy when you're doing design work. Uh, this kind of solver you can use for sanitary and combined sewers. Uh, but the strength of this solver is when you have complex pumping situations, um, because it uses that true pressure solver, it's better than even the dynamic solvers when it comes to doing a lot of pumping or if you have pressure sewers, those grinders that we talked about. Uh, this is a recommended solver. And then finally, the GVF Rational. Again, remember, this is only available for sewer gems. Uh, this is actually the Stormcat solver. And this was designed to calculate peak flows using, using the Rational method for hydrology. And it routes the C times A. I don't know if you guys remember, but the Rational um, method for calculating peak runoff out of a catchment is Q equals C times I times A, where C is the catchment um, C coefficient. Then I is the intensity, and then A is the area. So basically, it 
takes that C and A value and it routes it downstream. And as the system flow time increases, uh, then it recalculates the intensity at each of the nodes and then that's how it calculates the peak flows in the system. And once it figures out the flows, it calculates the hydraulic grade using the gradually varied flow method and it applies to stormwater systems. Okay, so now you have a better idea of all the options you have in sewer gems. In SewerCat, really, you don't really have very many options. You have only one solver um, that can handle uh, all those things we spoke about. Uh, but if you're in sewer gems and you find the need to switch between one solver and another, uh, why would you ever be in that situation? Well, one example could be uh, if you did a design using um, steady-state simulations, whether it was using um, the, the StormCat solver, the GVF Rational solver, and now you want to see what happens uh, over time and you're doing some dynamic analysis. Um, so, again, because they have different purposes, you uh, might need to switch between solvers. Uh, so be aware that all the elements are available in all the solvers. Um, usually there is no problem. You simply go to the drop down menu and you say, I'm going to pick a different solver. Um, in fact, the software would automatically filter the property grids to only show what is relevant to the current solver. Um, but there are some elements that behave different between one solver and another. Uh, particularly where things uh, differ are how each of those sol uh, solvers handles flow splits, uh, pump definitions, if you have control statements, and if you have ponds, those work a little bit differently. Um, and if you happen to have one of those elements and you switch a solver, typically when you switch the solver and you run, it will give you the warning messages as to what is handled different between them. So we try to make it real easy for you guys. Uh, okay, so I said that all the elements are available in all the solvers. Uh, so here's a list of all the elements that you have available to you. Okay, I figure I'll let you read that one. <laughs> Pretty self-explanatory. Um, we're going to be using uh, sanitary only um, elements for this class, for these three dates. So things like catchments, pond, pond out the structures, head walls, we really won't be using those. Uh, but we'll be using wet wells, pumps, and pressure and gravity elements. Another advantage of working uh, with sewer gems is that you, for the price of one, have actually four platforms available. So you could work uh, in what we call standalone, which is the platform we'll be using for this class. Uh, but you could also work inside of MicroStation or inside of AutoCAD or inside of ArcGIS. Uh, again, at no additional cost, you have all these platforms available with Sewer Gems. Okay, some of our users also use um, other software for roadway design. Um, and there's a lot of uh, relation with this uh, hydraulics and hydrology um, design, right? So if you use open roads, uh, you will actually have uh, in the subsurface utility um, part uh, already included a 100 inlet StormCAD license. Um, and if you wanted to use civil storm or sewer gems, uh, you can pay, pay a little bit more and actually have those products activated inside of open roads. So we're really well integrated with that product. Uh, if you use inroads, then to send files back and forth between inroads and sewer cat sewer gems, you can use the import and export feature. If you use geopack drainage, also import and export. Uh, if you use AutoCAD Civil 3D, you can import and export your files um, using LandXML. So LandXML is, um, is very nice because not only does it send you the, uh, the layout you know, of where your pipes are and your manholes, etc., it also sends 
um, information such as diameter, material, invert elevation, whatever properties you already have in Civil 3D. Okay, so this little chart here shows us the basics of how the modeling process um, typically goes. So the first part, uh, as always, is define the scope of your project. Uh, select which software you're going to use. Um, prepare the description of all your elements. Obtain loading data. Uh, loading data is very important because if you underestimate your loads, then you might end up with a design that you're like, oh, this looks pretty good. You know, this diameter is, this, uh, I don't know, six inch diameter is great for my entire network. <laughs> so really, your loads define your flows, right? And that's a primary determinant of how you end up um, sizing your um, entire network. So it's very important to do that. Uh, if this is for a system that you already exists, then you may or you will want to calibrate it, right? So it's not enough to say, okay, I got this contract and I'm going to model the sewer system for town X and I'm going to build it, get all their uh, maps and all the data of diameters and all that and give it back to them because you got to make sure that it actually reflects what they have in their system. Uh, so you want to calibrate the model. And to do that, you have to go into the field and measure things like flows in your system. You want to make sure that you also measure if there are places where you have overflows, uh, that you know when they happened, how they happened, was it raining, how much, what was the rainfall at that time. So um, very important to go through the calibration process. Um, so once you have everything, you build your initial model, um, you make sure that it runs and it gives you results. You compare that to the data that you've collected in the field um, and, you know, calibrate your, you know, your loads or your head losses, your friction methods, things like that. And then once you have a calibrated model, then that's what you use to make decisions. So things, for example, uh, you know, which are the pipes that we're going to renovate, uh, which are the ones that we're going to increase in diameter or things like that. So to make uh, good use of your model, it should be a calibrated model. Okay, so some tips for your modeling. Uh, Keep an eye or check frequently the data that you're inputting. Uh, if you're just starting a big model, we always recommend to start small with a little pilot area so you can see any potential problems uh, are easily found first and then you can uh, modify the rest of your data before you just dump it all into the program. Uh, once you have everything imported and you're ready to run, uh, it's important to understand what you want to run before you make those runs. Um, and this basically comes hand in hand with what we called alternatives and scenarios. We're going to talk about that um, later in the class. Uh, but with our software, you have the option of creating several what if scenarios within one file. Uh, and comparing the results between them, which is very, very handy when you do your, your engineering work. Um, but before you can really um, take advantage of those, you have to understand, okay, uh, this is my file, and what are the scenarios that I'm going to want to create? Um, because that will help you uh, properly structure your alternatives. Okay, so just uh, keep that in mind as we keep going through our three-day class, uh, understanding why we make the scenarios that we make and how we make them, right? What kind of alternatives are we going to need to set up for those? Um, when you first build your model, it's a large investment. And I don't mean just like, oh, we bought the software. Uh, I mean, it takes a lot of time putting it together and calibrating it. So, if you're the only modeler putting these uh, models together, make sure that you keep good records because if you leave the company 
uh, or something happens, and nobody's going to know why you did what you did. So it's important to keep uh, good records. You can keep them within the software. There's places where you can just write notes and explanations. Um, and also, if you can, train others because um, this isn't, you know, rocket science, but it takes a while, like everything, um, to get good at it, right? So if you're the only person that's good at it, then the next person that comes and knows nothing, um, you know, it will take them a long time. But if you can, you know, mentor someone within your company um, and just show them the ropes, that's always a good practice. Uh, and as always, remember that the software is only giving you the results based on the data that you input, um, I've worked in this industry for a long time, and I started out uh, in technical support. And sometimes we would have users say, oh, you know, the, this, this software is just giving me these results that make no sense. And, you know, we just kind of always have to, you know, very politely re remind them that it isn't the software. You know, it's, it's really the data that you input that generates those results. Um, so always be super uh, vigilant about the quality of the data that you're inputting. Okay, and just to finish, um, a reminder that before we had modeling software out there, uh, it was all done manually or doing Excel spreadsheets that didn't have, you know, like nice profiles or anything very intuitive. Uh, so we've come a long way <laughs> and the models will make your life as an engineer a lot easier. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like. If you want to see more such series, consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you, and see you next time.